In middle school, you spend one month learning how a volcano works, and you spend no time learning how a car works. How many times are you going to find yourself in a volcano compared to a car? <laughs> so that's my life passion, to introduce engineering into schools. And when I was sitting in your seats as a, a, a graduating senior, that's the last thing I thought I would ever be doing, trying to introduce engineering into the lives of young children. Advice number two, your life is the performance, not the rehearsal. Live it, love it, and enjoy it. Do not just continue preparing for it. It is happening now. And I have three hints that support this advice. Hint number one, combine your work with things you enjoy. Now, as a professor of mechanical engineering, uh, my teaching assignments were to teach fluid mechanics and heat transfer. Now, my personal hobbies are fishing and cooking. So how on earth do you combine teaching heat transfer and fluid mechanics with fishing and cooking? Well, you can. I developed two courses. My fishing course was called Life in Moving Fluids, which was fluid mechanics, but from the point of view of a fish. So you could do all sorts of studies and experiments of fluid mechanics and combine it with how fish think, how fish live, how fish have evolved, and that way I improved my fishing through teaching fluid mechanics. Now, the cooking course was, of course, heat transfer. When you cook, you transfer heat through conduction, convection, radiation from a source to a sink. So the heat transfer course had a lecture component where you teach all, all the, with, I taught all the traditional stuff that uh, chemists and MEs among you have taken. And, um, uh, and then we had to go to the laboratory to do the experiments. The laboratory was a state-of-the-art kitchen laboratory or you would do all sorts of experiments, and then actually it was the only laboratory, I think, in the Boston area that you get to eat the experiment at, at the end. Hint number two, question the norm and the expected. Let your life passion determine your direction, not your parents, colleagues, spouse, and friends. Now, I have three degrees from Tufts. I met my wife, Beth, at Tufts. I got married at Tufts, had worked only at Tufts, and our two golden retrievers are named after Tufts buildings. Baloo and Anderson. So no one, no one at Tufts had ever thought I would possibly leave Tufts at least until the dogs die. <laughs> so the museum opportunity came out of nowhere. The phone rang, it was a search firm, they told me I had been nominated for the president of the museum, and it was totally not what people would expect from me to do. Now, I love the Museum of Science. Uh, that was actually the first institution I visited during my orientation week at Tufts as an 18-year-old. And actually, my wife and I had our first date at the Museum of Science on March 13, 1982. Now, it was her choice, not my choice. So, <laughs> I had proposed the Hong Kong and Harvard Square with the scorpion bowl, so. <laughs> I guess the museum was a, was a safer spot for a, first, for a first date. But when this opportunity came, I immediately realized that my life passion to introduce engineering into the lives of children would have, been a, a, would have a better chance to becoming a reality than if I had stayed at Tufts. So I gave up my position, I gave up my tenure, and I picked up and left in two weeks, and I was right. Hit number three, most of the fun is out of your comfort zone. Question the norm and the expected. In your professional life, most of the excitement is not in your traditional discipline. It is hidden in the crevices between your discipline and other disciplines. Use your engineering knowledge and problem-solving skills to discover biology that biologists cannot, and invent new drug delivery mechanisms that doctors never imagined. In your personal life, have children because you really want to, not because it is what people do or they expect you to do. Travel to areas that will make your friends think you are crazy. And when you travel to big, popular cities, visit the food markets where the natives buy their food and taste foods you never thought would belong on a plate. And always remember, you're not too young or too old for anything. Advice number three, be a true ambassador of your engineering profession. Now, this is very important, folks, because we have a problem in the United States. In China, in general in Asia, and in Europe, everybody understands what engineers do, and engineering is very highly valued. In the United States, there is general confusion about what engineers are and what they do. People think that folks that drive trains are engineers, uh, folks that repair 
uh, radio station uh, equipment when something goes on, the DJ, if you listen to Mati in the morning, always calls for the engineer. And not too long ago, I was with my wife and children in a hotel in California. We checked in. My daughter went to use the toilet. It was clogged. My wife called, and they said, we'll send the engineer right up. To unclog. My wife was like, ah, the engineer is going to come and do the to toilet for you now. You know? <laughs> so, and you know, and this is all funny and stuff, but I went to a high school tour in Massachusetts, brand new school. And as they were giving me the tour, I noticed that the door next to career guidance was the janitor's closet, which had a big blue sign saying engineering on it, next to career guidance. And if you think that's bad, if you go to the National Academy of Engineering in DC, their building, their old building, their janitor closet says engineering outside. So why is this a problem? It's a problem because 72% of US engineers have had a relative that's an engineer. And a father, a mother, an uncle, an uncle, a grandparent, or a close family friend. How many of you, the graduating class, have had a relative that's an engineer or somebody that influenced you? See, it's exactly 72%. <laughs> now, and actually, in your case, it's about 85%. Actually, it's higher than normal. Now, here's the problem. You are the lucky ones. But how about the others that have not had a relative that's an engineer? And if you look at different ethnic groups, in ethnic groups that traditionally do not uh, choose engineering, there is no family mentorship toward engineering. And the only way to do that is either to introduce engineering in schools or have popular TV programs that promote engineering as a profession. That is a problem, was a problem with medical schools. Medical school applications were going down until ER showed up, and medical school applications went up. Law school applications were going down until practice and LA law showed up, and applications came up. What's the most popular science now? Forensic science, because of CSI, because kids watch the shows, and they think you could be wearing a micro mini skirt and a tank top and work in the dark with hot people, you know, <laughs> solving crime mysteries. Now, there is only one hero in primetime network TV that's an engineer, Homer Simpson. <laughs> and NASA, the most preeminent, and I sat on their board so I can badmouth them. Uh, so NASA, the most preeminent engineering entity in the world, the most preeminent engineering entity, the messages they sent out, when the Mars rover made it to Mars, they called it a science miracle. When something went wrong with it two years later, they called it an engineering error. <laughs> so, be proud of your profession. Take your own wrong turn while driving to work and get involved with your neighborhood high school or elementary school or middle school. Change the life of a child or the life of thousands of children by introducing them into engineering. And if you're wondering what happened to this little girl with the frizzy hair that started all that, that's responsible for me being here today, well, of course she won first prize at the science fair that year. <laughs> and what was wonderful that in the subsequent five years, girls won first prize, which was never happening in that school. Then she graduated with honors from the regional high school, and she got accepted by Haverford College, one of the best liberal arts schools in Pennsylvania, graduated with honors in biology and history, and then went to Tanzania. And she started her own not-for-profit foundation to fundraise and design and build science laboratories for the children there. And three years ago, the foundation reached the level where it was self-running, so she moved back. She's finishing her PhD in international education at Stanford, and she got married in August. So thank you, and good luck to you. <laughs>